Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the podcast, I'm speaking with Greg Hansen Sr. of GL Hansen and Sons, makers of the most unique and frankly, joyous composite materials out there. Composites can be used for many, many things, but of course, in this context, Greg's outfit creates the sought-after handle material called G-Carta. You've seen G-Carta featured on Pena knives, Three Rivers Manufacturing knives, Tom Crine knives, this Protex Strider I just cannot stop showing off, and many more. The world of composites is a bit of a mystery to me, so I'm very glad to have Greg Hansen Sr. on the show to talk about it. But first, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you know each time we upload a new video. And of course, if you know other knife junkies, share this video. It really helps get the word out. And if you want to support the show, you can do so by going to Patreon. The quickest way to get there is to head over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Today's podcast is brought to you in part by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash knife junkie. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, that's www.audibletrial.com forward slash knife junkie. Greg, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you. Hey, it's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I, this is going to be fun. So as I mentioned up front, uh, I have this Protex Strider that I got recently, and uh, I've been interested in their in their collaboration with Strider Knives, but when I saw these handle scales, uh, I, I, I flipped out, and I had to get this from a friend of mine. Um, I think you do beautiful work, and like I said before, joyous it's it's just a pleasure to look at what what is g carta what are composites well um g carta is, is uh it's actually a name that we had trademarked and the reason being is i didn't want the confusion with my carta uh, my carta is a phenolic it's a different process and g carta is epoxy in fabric or epoxy in cloth um compressed with you know under heat and pressure and it's it's cured and so you, you have the ability to, um, to get a lot different colors than you would with other processes because we use a very clear epoxy resin. So that's, um, that's it in a nutshell. It's pretty simple. Okay. All right. So this I did not know. I, 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 I knew that micarta was a, it's an, it, it's a proper name, right, for, an in, for a composite, right. but I didn't realize it was a totally different process. Uh, yeah. When you, so how do you get? How does it differ when you're actually making it? Well, um, micarta is, uh, you know, it was, it was uh, invented and developed by Westinghouse, and so it's a phenolic resin. Um, my understanding is the the paper or the fabric is coated and then dried, and then under heat and pressure that activates it, and um, you know they make these huge sheets like four feet by eight feet sheets. It's like, you could buy it like plywood. Um, I'm limited because of the epoxy resin. Um, the larger the volume of epoxy, the, the quicker that it sets off. So, you know, I can't make too big of a piece. Otherwise, uh, it, it sets off too quickly. So when I think of micarta or um, G10 or other kind of layered um fabric composites like that. Mm -hmm. They're very rigid in structure. They're very, they're rigid physically, but I mean, rigid in how they look, you know, very uniform lines, whatever the, whatever the uh, weave is of the fabric or whatever the texture is of the material. Right. But with, with your Parta, you get these kind of crazy, um, like to me, this looks like a topographical map a little bit. And it also looks kind of like, the inside of an organism, biological organism or something, you get these crazy sort of organic, very uh, non-structured looks. How, how, do you, how do you get that? Uh, that's just a, a function of the way the fabric's laid up. So, 
you know, we, we uh, fold it, iron it. Uh, we lay up the blocks dry. And so um, actually that's when the, the, the blocks get designed dry and then um, they're weighed uh, because, you know, we're trying to achieve a certain uh, fabric to epoxy ratio. Hmm. And then, um, you know, they're stacked and ready to get laid up. And so then when out in the shop, when I'm laying them up, I pull them off uh, in the certain order that they're stacked so that we can try to maintain that. But they go into a 40 ton press. So, Hmm. you know, it things happen. You don't anticipate Um, you put them under that much pressure and things move around. So sometimes they doesn't work as well as you hoped and sometimes it comes out better so is it a lot of kind of happy accidents happening and and you get (laughs) things you're not expecting all the time yeah it's yeah the the only way you 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 can learn it is to do it there's there's no substitute you you know you can if you're just doing some very simple plain flat layered uh, patterns you know you can kind of figure out how it's going to look but even even the colors uh they'll change so the epoxy you know how however it interacts like i've i've yet to be able to get a a bright red or a bright yellow Hmm. um just doesn't happen it's a pretty bright red on mine i I think it's called patriotic something or other i I can't remember exactly what the americana americana Uh, yeah yeah so that um that one it if if you saw the fabric before it's laid up, then you would you would understand. You go, oh yeah, that is quite a bit darker. But um, I I think it works. You know, a lot of times you don't have to get an exact representation. You just have to to kind of get the the idea. You know, and that's everyone knows that is red, white, and blue. If you held it up to an American flag, the colors would not be exactly the same. But right. You know, everyone knows what it is. How, well, how did you how did you get into this? What what made you think to to do this in the first place? A friend of mine, uh, who's a knife maker, had just tried to buy some handle material, and uh, you know he was frustrated. And he came over to my house. He goes, "Dude, you should make micarta." And I said, "Well, what is it?" And he showed me, and he goes, "Go on YouTube, and you know you'll." You'll see how they do it. So I went on YouTube and, you know, I saw all these C clamps and two by fours and milk cartons. And it's like, oh, you can't make any money doing that. You know, it's like, <laughs> you got to do better. So I, um, I just started messing around with it. And, you know, I'm, uh, I'll be 65 this year. I was looking for, a, you know, kind of a retirement home manufacturing gig. So, uh, I'd been a general contractor for over 30 years and I was, I was pretty well done with that, you know? Um, and so I started doing this and I started with the, uh, you know, the regular, uh, polyester boat resin, you know, it's about a fourth the price. And, um, you know, I, I made some real garbage. Um, uh, and then it was, that was it's I started probably about May or June of it was three years ago and um, not quite three years ago. And then in August, I remember I, I sold my first August 2nd was my first sale. And so that was kind of my, you know, my milestone. It's like, hey, I'm I'm making money now. So, <laughs> I, you know, the first month, I think I made like four or five hundred bucks. Um, I thought, well, you know better than a poke in the eye, but you got to do better than that. So, you know, next month I about doubled it and then it just, it kept growing. And in, in three months time, I quit contracting and wow, never looked back. This is, wow. it's just taken off and, um, you know, I've gone through a move and divorce and, you know, just things that, that happen. And, um, the the business is just it's growing to the point where you know i i used to call it unique micarta and then i started getting these these letters from people saying you know you're gonna get sued and mm-hmm. it's like oh golly i don't want that so i um 
uh, a friend of mine actually came up with the name G Carta because we wanted something kind of short, you know, um, that the conveyed the point. And, um, so then I went, I had that trademarked, um, so that it wouldn't, there would be no mistake. So, uh, your friend, your knife making friend first inspired you to do this. Did you have any idea that, uh, well, first of all, that the knife world or the knife market was such a, a vital and thriving place. And did you have any idea that you would, uh, that people would just be clamoring to get your material? No clue. Absolutely. No clue. He, I had 266 followers on Instagram and, um, he told me, he goes, you know, follow this guy. I, and I go, okay. So this guy had a knife and he put it up for auction and, uh, oh man, saying low battery on my phone. Um, so this guy put this knife up for auction. It sold for like $13,000 and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, you know? And, um, he's like, no, that's, you know, that's about what he gets. So. I'm like, well, who would who would spend that kind of money? And he's like collectors, and and it just still had no um, reality to it. You know, it's like, man, I'm driving a beat up old three four thousand dollar van, and somebody's buying a thirteen thousand dollar knife. It's hard to you know <laughs> comprehend yeah. that, right? Yeah. And um, so I started doing this, and I said, I remember there was a, a company out there. And I said, man, I, I wish I could, you know, be as good as that guy. And he goes, well, how about the best in the world? And I'm like, yeah, right, you know. And, um, you know, things started progressing and started going. And kind of the reality set sunk in maybe a year or so ago that um, it, it is really kind of a unique thing that not anybody else is, you know, really doing. So. I, I just continue to run with it. I, the, the hardest thing is I got so many ideas in my head that I want to do and, and I'm busy making stuff to fill orders, you know, and I, yeah. I don't want to do that. I want to make new stuff, you know? And so I've, I've had some helpers, you know, along the way and it's pretty tough to, to find the right people. You gotta be weird or something, you know, to, or, or <laughs> pa passionate about very particular things, you know. I could see, yeah. I could see um, people who are into knives, people uh, who. But it's not just that. I mean, one of the things that's striking to me about your material about G Carta is that they look like abstract paintings. You know, you could you could look at them in a lot of different ways. And to me, these things, and uh, you know, you showed me your EDC, which is the same, basically the same thing, different different model of. Uh, different pattern, but they look like abstract works of art. They're just small and condensed and three dimensional. Well, that, um, and thank you. Um, so kind of, you know, along, along the journey of, of this, um, a friend of mine who I've, I've known her for, I think 21 years. Um, we used to go to the same church. We were on a, an art team together and, um, I was talking to her and, and she said, yeah, her husband wanted her to, you know, to, to work. And I said, well, I need help. You know, I'll hire you. So uh, she came over and she saw the fabric that I had. And, you know, because I typically will have, you know, maybe a thousand yards of fabric in the house and all these different colors and they're cut. And she goes, wow, I could have fun with this. Well, it didn't even didn't even register to me, but she was a fashion designer she was trained to put colors and patterns and textures together. Right. And her name's Mikey. And, and so, um, I said, well, you know, fly at it. And so Mikey starts designing, well, the knife community, I mean, it's such a great community and they just latched right on to her and, and, you know, like, yeah, go Mikey, go. And so she was coming up with these really wild and bright patterns and colors. And it just seemed like, the more fun she had, the more they liked it. And they just totally embraced her. And then it's just kind of, we've built off of that. But um, the very first uh, maze pattern that I did, what, the reason I did it was uh, 
starting out, I, I spent all my money and, uh, you know, even buying a couple of bolts of fabric was, you know, tough to do yeah. at one point. And so, um, I had remnants and I had enough remnants to put together four colors and make a complete block. And I thought, well, I'll do this. And that way, you know, I can keep working until some more money comes in. And then the thing, so as soon as I, uh, showed it, it sold the whole thing. And I remember I was upset. I was like, ah, oh, crud, you know, now, <laughs> now I'm really stuck, <laughs> you know? And, um, but that was, that was the, the start of, uh, doing the multicolored patterns. And then I was, uh, I was inspired. There's, there's a guy over in Russia, crazy fiber. And, and I saw mm. his stuff and I was like, you know, I can kind of see how I could do part of that. I don't know how he gets it going in both directions, but I'm going to have some fun with that. And so I, I made some of that and, and nobody really liked it much. Hmm. You know, it was just kind of, um, just kind of there. And, and Nick Timpson, uh, a friend of mine who makes folders, he made a folder with it and it really came out nice. And it was like, you know, I, I wanted to, to buy it and it was on auction. And I remember, um, I quit bidding on it, you know, I don't know what 400 and something dollars. And the thing ended up selling for like 600 and something dollars. Wow. And the guy that bought it backed out and then another guy, he had a backup offer and that guy backed up. And so Nick, I mean, he's a great guy. He just, he just, he mailed it. He goes, I know you wanted that knife. And he just gave it to me, uh, he mailed it to me. And that's um, uh, Nick Timpson of Birdvis. Birdvis yeah. knives. Yeah. 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 And Nick does great work. I mean, oh, he's God, it's beautiful, you know, and him and I started about the same time. So, um, we used to live about probably 15 miles apart and, you know, we'd meet every once in a while and, and, um, swap stories and all that. So it, it's been fun to watch his business grow and, you know, and he's helped my business grow. So that was, I, that was I am cool. not surprised. Uh, I am not surprised that it took off the way it did because I've, I can't put an actual time frame on it, but there was a time in folding knives, um, I don't know, seven, ten, five years ago, where people started demanding color. Like people, it seemed like people just started getting sick of black G10 and silver blade. And, um, you know, Spyderco was coming out with some, you know, their plastic handled knives, uh, their, their grivery or, or, glass reinforced nylon in, in bright colors. And, and so were some other production companies. And I, I feel like people really kind of all at once got a, got a taste for color on their knives. These aren't just, uh, you know, things that you're taking out into the field or, uh, you know, wearing on your utility belt as a police officer or, or a general contractor or what have you. These are also little works of, of art or design that people love to collect. And so, um, you know, people's tastes immediately burst out of that, that sort of silver and black thing. And, yeah. and, uh, you know, I, I think the solid color plastic handle held people for a little while, but then to see something like your work kind of explode onto the scene, I am not surprised that it became a sought after thing. Yeah. It, it, it took me by surprise because, um, and, and I'm still this way. I'm, I'm really more focused on the process and, you know, on, in what I do and the knife makers and just the makers, um, mm -hmm. uh, constantly amaze me, the things that they make with it. Um, you know, there's guys making little gadgets and openers and, and, um, uh, oh, fidget kind of thing and earrings and, you know, it just, it goes on and on and on. And it's like, man, I, those, those guys are the artists. And, um, you know, I, I just, I really try to focus on my part of it. I don't, honestly, I don't have time to do all this stuff. And if I, if I get sidetracked then I don't get my work done. So, um, it's, it, it's really fun. Um, you know, and I, like I say, I, you know, I got ideas that, I want to do stuff and, and like I'm working on a, a thing right now. Uh, I call it cow carta 
and instead of fabric we're using leather oh and um mm. it's uh it 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 comes out i don't know if you'll be able to see this can you yeah i can make some of that out geez now i i just mm, i love leather and the thought of well wait okay so all right cow carta that's and awesome. there's here's a, a a worry donut ryan rimmer out of texas made this and that out of and that's cow carta so does it have the same kind of impervious feel that uh g carta has no um it the, the leather doesn't uh, get a hundred percent absorption so even when you cut it it still smells like leather mm. and you know, I, I typically oil it or wax it up or, and, you know, to see. But I'm right now I've, I've got about 35 um, different makers that make all kinds of different stuff. And I've and I've sent out uh, the cow carta and I just want them to do their their interpretation, you know, what what they want to do with that. And um, and then we're going to get it photographed and. I'd like to do some promotion with that to just help promote all the makers and their different styles and abilities and all that. So are you talking about knife makers or, or is cow Carta getting into the hands of knife makers? Uh, Cause I can think yeah. of, them, yeah. yeah, stacked, stacked cow Carta handles, like stacked leather handles, like on a K bar or sheath. Mm -hmm. So is it um, flexible? Uh, does it remain flexible or does it get real rigid or a little flexible? It's, you know, like, like this piece here is, is probably three sixteenths of an inch thick. Okay. And you can see, but it's, it's not liking that, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, so where do you source your materials, uh, your fabrics <laughs> and, uh, well, in this case, your, your leathers also, but I mean, do you just go to Joanne fabrics at the mall and, uh, pick up bolts of fabric and how does that work? Yeah. You can't really do that. Um, it just, it costs too much mm -hmm. and, and so, but I do buy from Joanne, but I'll do it online and I have to do it selectively. And, um, you know, I, I placed an order today, a small order, but, um, I also buy from a, a wholesaler on the East coast that, you know, Joanne buys from. Mm -hmm. And so, but you know, you're, you're putting together minimum orders and, you know, like you, a lot of it will come like in a 50 yard roll. And so I actually, um, to cut that, I, uh, contacted a, uh, bandsaw blade manufacturer and I had him, uh, make me some blades that will cut fabric. And so I can cut them on my bandsaw. Oh, wow. And, um, that's the kind of stuff I really like to do is, is, you know, that kind of work or innovation, you know, I like to, I like to make the tools. Um, that's, that's kind of the fun for me. Um. I like to see what happens, you know, just whatever. And and that's the fun of making the G card is, is you don't really know how it's going to turn out um, when you're doing the more random, the freer patterns, you know? And so that's, that's a lot of fun. It's kind of like having a kid, you know, like, Oh, we're going to see what it looks like. It also sounds like a, um, a, a little bit of mad scientist, a little bit of like painter artist, but also a lot of your, um, general contracting instincts coming out there. I've, I've had to use, you know, things that I've learned along the way. Um, you know, I've taken, I don't know, five or six semesters of welding, you know, in college at, I didn't go to regular college, but at the community college and, you know, I, I weld up my own stuff. Um, my son, uh, my middle son, Jim is a mechanical engineer and he designed and built my presses. Uh, we've got a 20 ton and a 40 ton heated bed press. Um, you know, it's just, you can't buy this stuff, so you got to make it. Um, and it's nice having an engineer in the family. Right. So that's part of what you're talking about. You said, you said that you like making the tools and you're, you're saying quite literally you like making these giant. So what do these presses look like? And is um, there heat involved? Yeah. Yeah. We, okay. we built heated beds in them because we use that to, um, uh, post cure the resin. And then, uh, you know, cause the epoxy, the, the stuff I use is so slow. It, if you put a, you know, a half a cup of it on the table, it'll, it'll stay liquid for a day and a half in this <laughs> weather. Um, 
you know, maybe two days, but, um, it's, uh, you know, the heat at, the heat does a couple different things. Uh, you know, in Idaho, it's, it's cooler weather, even though I have a heated garage, but, um, epoxy, when, when you heat it up, it'll thin it. So if you physically thin it, like chemically thin it, you're going to affect the integrity of it. And so you, you know, it's really not a good way to go. Um, but with the heat, you don't. And so you get it to flow and, uh, I use vacuum chambers right now. I'm, I'm going to, um, I've got another vacuum chamber project in the works, um, that is going to up my capacity from, from six bricks at a time up to 10 and, um, and also allow me to use, uh, the vacuum chambers longer. So that's the, you know, on the, on the mechanic side of it right now, that's the, the real challenge for me is getting them in the vacuum chamber long enough to completely el eliminate the porosity every time. Okay. And, um, sorry. What's porosity? Well, it's the, the tiny air bubbles. Oh, oh, okay. So if, if you can imagine the fabrics full of air and even though you, you saturate it in the epoxy, if you take that and you squeeze it with a 40 ton press, you're going to release air out of the fabric and that's going to create those tiny bubbles. And then it, it won't be as crisp the, the color wise. And then, um, you know, it's just, it's inferior. Yeah. 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 So the vacuum, uh, draws all of that out, uh, in concert with the pressure and the heat basically. Yeah. The, and the pressure and the heat comes after, but it's, oh, okay. it's prior to going into the pressure and heat. But I, I was going to try to do it at the same time. Like you, like you were saying, um, and it can be done. It's just, um, you know, it, there's a, there's a cost for everything. <laughs> so it's like, it, are you really going to get the payback? You know, and I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible and cost effective as possible. So, um, you know, there's shoot, there's walk-in vacuum chambers, you know, right. But not in my garage. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's soon to come. Yeah, I could, I mean, I, you know, I, the, the way it's going, I, I will, you know, I'll get pushed out. I live alone. So, so my house is my shop. I have a fabric room. I've got, this is the office that we're in now. And so all the shipping happens out of this room. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a, a four bedroom house with a, uh, an office. And I basically live in, in the, one of the bedrooms and then one's a fabric room and it just is nothing but fabric. Another one is a, a shredding room. Part of our process is when you cut the fabric, we take all the scraps and we shred it and then make rag micarta with that. Oh, so, wow. or G carta here all I am right. calling it the wrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get sued, man. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> yeah. My, my battery's getting low. I, I want to show you uh, my pro tech knife though. Yeah. Let me see. Pro tech. Um, you know, I met him, I met the, um, or actually, I don't know Dave? if I met him at the, at the show in Anaheim, but I, I was there. And, um, so this one was a, a pattern Mikey had come up with and it, uh, it's called night fire. Uh, um, but there was a pro tech night, very similar to yours. And not that long ago, maybe six months ago or so it came up for sale on Instagram. And so I messaged the guy I said, is the knife available? And he says, yeah. And, he told me, um, or I asked him how much it was, and he told me, he goes, but I won't sell, sell it to you. I, I said, I, I really want to buy it. I made the handle material. And he says, well, I'm aware of who you are. Um, I'm just going to send it to you. And so he just, he mailed me the knife. Like, I didn't know what to do. I mean, I was like, this is crazy. I mean, it, I, you know, I don't remember. I, it was like a $350 knife or something, right? Wow. He just gave it to me and he wasn't a knife maker he was a collector <coughs> and I, I uh guy in california and i'm just like you know i i just can't let him do that that's it just i was i felt guilty you know so um it was really cool the next week protect called me up and i'm, I'm talking to derek and i said hey if i want to get a you know a couple knives made um for me, can I do that? And he's, oh yeah, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll work again. So, um, 
I got a hold of the guy that gave me the knife and I said, go to my website and pick out any pattern you like. And I'm going to have you a, a knife made of Protec. And so um, the That's knife cool. I bought from him, I gave to my oldest son. It was, it was just, I'm very proud of that knife. And um, so at any rate, he's like, you kidding me? And, and so he did. And the pattern that he picked was one that Mikey reproduced that's on that knife that Nick Timpson made that I have. The very first one. And, and nice. the guy didn't know it. He, it just happened that way. So, you know, the whole thing happened and, and I sent him the knife and, and he gave it to his oldest son. He didn't know I'd given oh, that's cool. mine to my oldest son. So we, we've become friends through this. And now he's, he's making knives and he's doing a really great job. Uh, hang on one hang on one second. I'm okay. I'm afraid your phone is gonna plots before we're done with this conversation. Can okay. you plug can you plug it in? Can you take I, a moment and just to plug it in? I can, but I'll lose my headphones. Okay. Uh will that work? Fair enough. Yeah, I'd I'd rather finish the conversation. And then I'll start back up there, and I'm going to ask you about that knife maker too. Okay, here um, we got power. Okay, I believe. I apologize. I didn't anticipate using my phone on this. Yeah, no, no sweat. Okay, we should be good. Okay, you feel free to take those out of your ears now. That's good. <laughs> so, um, all right. So I'm just going to start here, Jim. Okay. Uh, so it all came full circle. Basically, that first knife you got from Nick Timpson ended up being the knife that you had, uh, same material you had, uh, that you made this um, Protec for, for the gentleman who gifted you the Protec. That's a cool little uh, circle there. Yeah, it, it was it was very cool. It's And, you know, it's that's the thing that I'm, I've learned about the, the knife community. It's, it's like the greatest group of people I could ever imagine being uh, involved with. <laughs> And I used to never keep track of like who paid me or, or not. And, and one time a guy, you know, he, a couple of months after he bought something, he goes, Hey, PayPal returned my money. I, I guess I typed in the address wrong. And what's your correct address? And he said it was 50 bucks. And I never would have known, you know, he sent it to me. It, it is a common theme over and over on this show and the other shows we do here. Uh, how great the people who collect knives happen to be, you know, yeah. of course there's always, there's going to be someone, but I, you know, people just have this shared love of knives and it has a, um, uh, people coming from all different backgrounds, different, different types of collections, different reasons for collecting. Um, yeah. you know, my reasons over the years have changed, have broadened in why I collect and, and, and since starting this podcast, it's been about unique stuff and 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 this is unique because there will never be another block just like this correct that and it's like wood you know wood grain right you if you see some wood grain that you like you better buy it because you may never see it again you know? right so so you make uh different from my carta you make you make g carta in blocks how big are the blocks and, and uh, how did, do, when, when knife makers or, or any sort of maker reaches out to you, do they buy whole blocks? Well, the, the biggest that I make is eight inches. They're, they're typically one and seven eighths inch thick. Um, and then eight inches by 14 inches is the absolute biggest that I make. Um, and, and I have a website that I sell scales and, and blocks on, um, and that's how I do most of my sales. There's been some manufacturers that I sell to and it's, it's all individual, um, you know, TRM, for instance, uh, you know, I, I prep them and, and cut them so that they have less work on their end. But, you know, as far as any of the manufacturers, I do the most work on their material before I ship it. So, and it's all just whatever they want, you know, I'm, I'm set up to, you know, more and more all the time to try to cater to what they want. So your name is, uh, your business name is GL Hansen and Sons. Uh, 
how is it working with sons? Like, what, what is what are the? Uh, <laughs> I don't mean to. Uh, maybe that's a sensitive question, but uh, yeah. it's it, it's interesting to me. Family businesses in general, but especially a family business around uh, making something is very interesting to me. How does that work? What's the what's the dynamic? Well, um, so it, at this point, we don't work together on a day to day basis. Um, GL Hansen and Sons, what, what happened with that was, um, when I changed the name from Unique Micarta, I, I changed it to something, I don't even remember what it was. And somebody contacted me and they said, man, I've been using that name for 10 years. And <coughs> excuse me. So after having gone through the, the name, uh, with my construction, being a general contractor, which was GL Hansen and Sons, um, one of the reasons that we chose that um, was we thought it was funny because my kids were like eight years old, you know, <laughs> and um, I didn't have to get a fictitious business license name because it had my name in the name. So it, it just made it easy to do it that way. Well, when this was happening for this company, I didn't really have the time or the energy to mess around with that. And so I just called it GL Hansen and Sons um, because it was already a known entity. Um, and that way I just carried that on over. So, and now uh, my oldest son, he's going to be, um, he's been helping out and he's going to be uh, coming on board this summer. Um, he's te he teaches at a college. So his, he's get his summers off and then, um, we're we're planning stuff we 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 have a cnc router uh a laser engraver and a 3d printer that we recently got and and he's a, a tech guy i'm not the tech guy right and so he's going to work on that we're planning on doing gun grips um the cow carta is uh primary use for that is is we want to make gun grips we just think it'd be a great material for it look good We'll start out with 1911 grip. So, oh man, it's uh, that's kind of the dream there. And and because I make it, then you know I won't have to worry about sourcing it somewhere. It's I just won't sell it, you know, because we'll be selling the gun grips and all that. Um, so I was kind of kind of asked you before, but so what's the response from the knife community to Calcarta? Has there been any? Has it been out long enough to to gauge? Yeah, it, it's I when I when I made the first brick, I cut it up and I just basically gave it away. Mm -hmm. And a couple of the makers sent me knives they made with it, um, which was just super cool. Um, and it was it was all positive. And I get requests pretty often, like, when are you going to make that again? <coughs> um, and recently, uh, Francesca Ritchie of um, uh, Teton Leather Company, um, and she does this amazing sheath work. And so we've been uh, working together. She's making me some stuff, and and she came over and we spent a day in the shop, and we we made up some uh, stuff with python scales and some Ooh. stingray, and we're we're experimenting with the exotic. So um, nothing really to announce on that, other than. You know, we're always we're always trying to work on something. You, if if you don't, you, then you you just start manufacturing. I'm not really a manufacturer. I I like R and D, so I just manufacture so I can do the R and D. Yeah. So, do you think that uh, you call this um, sort of a an encore career to your um, to your general contracting? Do you think the fact that this is a business that you've built post career, if you will, do you think that that has made it um, more of a labor of love and therefore so successful? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm blown away, you know? Yeah. I think Jesus every day, I, you know what, this, it's, it's like this fell out of the sky into my lap and, um, you know, I, I couldn't be happier. Um, you know, I, every day I get a 
think, well, let's see what happens. You know, it's kind of an adventure all the time. And, you know, yeah, there's parts of it. I, I get tired. I, I, I put in so many hours, like sometimes I get a little burned out, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it is a labor of love. I just, I just love doing it. If I could, you know, if I could have somebody do, it's not really grunt work, but it's the, the filling of the, the manufacturer's orders and, and those right. things, you know, yeah. there's, um, you know, one, one pattern, uh, Mexican blanket, especial. Um, yeah. you know, there's, there's times where I I'm selling over 20 blocks of that a month. Wow. Um, and I, I get a little tired of making it, you know, it's right. I can tell you if there's one extra layer of fabric in there, I mean, it, you know, you just get to know it intimately. And, um, that all started with Mikey and I having lunch one day and she got her phone out and took a picture of a, of an advertisement and came back to the shop and she laid up this, this brick. And then I, I cast it in the resin and, that thing has been our number one seller for, I don't know, probably a year. I mean, like two to one. Wow. It, all over the world. I mean, you know, it's, it's gone to China and Germany and New Zealand and, and all these places. And I, it just blows me away. Well, it seems like that might be, yeah. I, well, I think we're looking at two panels of that maybe on the lower, lower left of what Jim has up here. Yeah, uh, it's the second from the left on the bottom. God, it's gorgeous. It it is really uh, another thing about these um about these oh god, the Jakarta is that they have dimension, they have depth to them. They're not just colorful on the surface. They seem to they have a sort of a, an illusion of depth that is very pleasing. It's it's more than just the color and the pattern. Oh, I lost a... you first. Oh, okay, yeah, I lost you too. Uh, I was gonna say they they have they seem to have a real depth to them. It's not just on the surface color and pattern. Mm -hmm. And then you look at that Mexican blanket, and and it really it looks like a horizon. It looks it looks like it goes off into space. Well, thanks. That um, yeah, and that's a combination of a couple of different things. You know, M Mikey is a she's a genius with colors. I mean, she puts stuff together that it just it constantly amazes me and if you have that in the combination with no porosity you you'll get that depth the porosity will kill the depth um and so that's one of the reasons to to get rid of the porosity that air in there is is um you know there when a block comes out really good and i'm sanding it it looks like there's an eighth of an inch of clear over the fabric mm -hmm. And there's not, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's right there, but it, it does give you that illusion. So it's hard to get that. So you might be wrestling sometimes with the fact that there's so much demand for that pattern, say, for instance, but really you want to keep trying new things and being creative. It seems also. Yeah, not even early. Also, just that's all I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I don't have that luxury right now, but maybe someday, you know? Yeah. That, Cause that's, that's the fun. I mean, you know, as a kid, I was the one that would say, well, I wonder what would happen if, you know, and what, what if we add 40 tons of pressure to this? <laughs> Let's see what well, happens. Yeah. There was, um, when you know, it was, my son lives in Seattle. So we were making it over there and, and so I had the grandkids around there and we took golf balls and squished them and all this different stuff just to see what would happen, you know, wow. and there isn't too much that will withstand 40 tons of pressure. <laughs> so what, what do you, how do you see, um, well, not, not necessarily how do you see the company growing, but how do you see your product line and your, creativity with this material growing what kind of things do you want to try that you haven't tried well what what's your what if um well of course the cow carta you know is is a big one right now because right. um 
I've just been able to do enough with that to, to frustrate me, you know, mm -hmm. um, I, I want to do more. Um, let's see. I, I enjoy, um, one of, one of the challenges that, that I, that I always give myself is to try to do something that has not been done. And so, um, like with a rag, my card, it's, it's very labor intensive and difficult to make rag. And so, um, I've wanted to, uh, to try to perfect that. And, and I feel like I'm, I'm really close. I, you know, I, I can't get it perfect every time, but I've, I've had several really good blocks. Um, but then you, then you have these colors. Um, and I don't know if you can see this, this is, this was one. Mm, yeah. And so the kind of the unique thing about doing the rag, the way, the way I do it like this is, um, you, this is the cross cut view and it's, it's significantly different than the flat cut view. And so, you know, the different, the, the flat cut would be the more traditional looking rag. And so I'm, I'm having fun developing, um, it kind of remakes of the vintage stuff. So on the rag, my card, I have one I call Vinto rag and it's, it mimics some of the vintage colors on the, on the paper. I have some that mimics old Westinghouse. And so I call it Westing foe, um, <laughs> you know, and it's just, I, I have fun with that. And it, it, and that's a challenge. It's like, I'll see a picture somewhere and it's like, Oh, well, I'll try to make that and see what happens. Um, so I, I enjoy doing that. So it, it's going to, for a while, it's just going to be more of what I'm already doing just haven't been able to do it yet. Um, now, let me ask you, and uh, this might be going too far into the rabbit hole, but you said that um, RAG G Carta is the most difficult or, or is giving you the most challenge right now. Um, and, and intuitively, I would think that that would be the easiest. Oh, do you just take all your bits and throw it in there? And so what about RAG is, is more difficult than say the um, Mexican blanket? Um, it's porosity. Always, it's always oh, porosity. Yeah. And so on the rag, um, you know, the, the way that commercially it was manufactured was under a tremendous amount of pressure. It's super dense and that helps give it that look. And so you could have less porosity with a lot more resin, a lot, a lot less fabric, but you're not going to have the same look. Um, and I don't think it's as good a look. Um, so, and, and I've messed around with some different things with the rag. I've put copper bits in there. Um, I currently have some uh, titanium that I'm anodizing that I want to put because you get the colors with that and, and, you know, do that with some black rag and, and some reflectivity, I guess. Yeah. Oh yeah. man. So, you know, just kind of messing around with that, that kind of stuff. We did one with copper mesh that it really sold well, but it's kind of problematic. You know, uh, the more experienced makers, um, uh, handled it better, but, uh, we took, uh, copper mesh you can get this copper mesh it actually comes in a tube and it's used for like wrap proofing and construction and um we we laid that up in a pattern in in uh, a cross cut black and so it was the black and copper and, and the makers i i got a request for it just the other day it's a pain in the neck to make um you know the, the copper pieces at some point are short and they can fall out of the, the fabric. So for a maker's point of view, it can be frustrating. And so like if you're sculpting it, you might hit a, you might hit one that just doesn't have enough purchase or you've, you've worn it down enough that it's going to fall out or and create exactly. a void or something. Yeah. So do you work directly with knife makers? Do you have knife makers uh, or any type of maker, but here we talk about knives come to you and say, I want you to make me a, uh, a, a G Carta with these colors and this kind of pattern. Does that happen or? Yeah. Yeah. All the time. Um, 
I, I put on my Instagram, no special orders. And <laughs> it's, it's kind of a lie. I, I mean, I'll, t- I'll tell people, you know, they say, do you take special orders? And I just say, if I'm in the mood, you know, it's right. right. I get to be a cranky old man. Cause, um, <laughs> You know, if it's not something that I really want to do, um, I, I, I don't want to do it. I mean, I have so many things I want to do. I, I'm, you know, I'm not going to put, do something else just if I don't want to do it. Um, hey, uh, Jim, can you stop there and, and go back up a little bit? Uh, Jim's showing some of the some of your work here. And in the middle, that knife, that Tom Crime knife, I've seen a bit of that. Uh, what is that? To me, it looks like the surface of Saturn or, uh, Jupiter or yeah, Jupiter. What, how do you make that with the, with the little, with the balls and the different, uh, it looks like a storm on, on, on Jupiter. Yeah, that, um, that was, uh, Mikey's creation. Um, and so, um, you know, she found some rope that would work. And so we used that rope in there and that's what gives those, those round balls. Um, you know, it's really been a very cool thing to work with because you can put it in a brown tone pattern. It'll look like knots in wood. Um, that was actually, that one was called Starry Night, that, that pattern, even though uh, there's been so many variations of it and some of it look more like Starry Night than others. So it's, right. um, but I like the fact that, you know, we, we don't make them the same every time. Um, the, the closest we've come to that is count how many ropes are in a block and then duplicate that. But. Right. But it seems like the kind of thing that's just kind of impossible to, to duplicate. You can kind of get it in the ballpark or, or right. create a style, but yeah. that's about it. Yeah. And, and it's like, why try? Yeah. You know, there's no, well, then it wouldn't be unique anymore. Right. right. <laughs> and yeah. that's part of the, that's part of the whole thing. So uh, do you want to expand your uh, operation? Um, again, that, w- that would reduce its uniqueness. But I mean, how, how, do you, how much do you want this to grow? It seems like it uh, end, uh, you know, has endless potential with the love people have for it and with the just inherent joy and beauty of it. It seems like you could, you could take it as far as you want it. How big do you want this to become? That's a great question. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, you know, uh, I really enjoy doing what I'm doing and you know, that I just want to keep enjoying what I'm doing. And it's, I don't really have aspirations of, of, uh, you know, greatness here or anything, but it, it's like the, the biggest motivator for me for growing is if, somebody wants to place an order and it, you know basically i want to make people happy you know it's like you know like your knife that that you're showing there i can tell you you really like that knife mm-hmm. you know and it's like it wouldn't be the same knife with uh g10 handles nothing against g10 it's just that it makes it different it makes it special to you and so i get a lot of pleasure out of that and you know, so if a company says, hey, I want, you know, 20 blocks of this or 15 sheets of that, I want to do it because it's going to make people happy. Of course, I'm going to make some money at it and all that, which makes me happy. But, <laughs> you know, it's um, I mean, it's a win win. You know, it, it's like why I don't I don't see an upside of like containing that. I want as much of that to happen as possible within reason. You know, right. So, but it's it's going to be a challenge to to grow. I, you know, I've I've had people help me, and and of course, there's always people giving me advice. And and you know, one of the things people will say is, "Don't give away your secrets because somebody will copy you." And it's like, well, how's that going to happen? I've tried to tell people what I do so they can help me, and they and they can't do it. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. <laughs> if somebody can figure it out by the little information that I've given them, they don't need me anyway. You know, it's like, they're going to figure it out. So, um, well, you know, you mentioned sheath making before and, uh, uh, in, in the, in the, in the arena of 
custom knives and leather sheaths. Sheath making is is an entire art form, and so really, when a when a custom knife maker uh, has a sheath made from a Francesco Ricci, for instance. Uh, that is a collaboration. That's two artists or artisans or whatever you want to call them working together. And and to me, that's what your G Carta and that's what your Cow Carta and that's what your unique composites are. It's you are an, a, an artist, artisan working alongside these others. And, um, you know, without, without, without their knife, you know, you, you would have these beautiful blocks and without your beautiful blocks, they'd have just a piece of sharpened steel, you know, or a beautiful blade, whatever it is, but, but together they come together to, to create a collaboration. That's just, um, you know, something more than the sum of its parts. Well, thanks. Uh, it, it, it feels that way to me. You know, it's, I, I look at what I do is, you know, I, I make a component and I hand it off to an artist. I'm not an artist. I can't draw you a stick figure. Um, but you know, these guys take it and knife makers in particular, they're like the most innovative um, people, you know, they come up with ways and techniques and processes, all this stuff. And I, I remember I was talking to one guy and he said, well, you know, this has a bit of process. He goes, oh, that's no problem for me. This is what I do. You know, and he had it all figured out and it's like, okay, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's great. Um, and there's, you know, the other thing is in the knife community, there's a lot of shared information. They're very open with, hey, you need some help. This is how you do it. And so, and, and I want to be the same way. I, I just, you know, I guard, I don't really feel like I have a secret to guard. Anybody can go and buy epoxy and they can go buy fabric and they can do what I'm doing. You know, if, if they want to, you know, and I've helped out a couple of guys and, and one guy actually is in a different country, but he will copy my patterns like identically. And he even used my name, my trademark name, you know, and it's like, I, you know, I'm not going to get upset about it really. It's like, it, I can't keep up with the work that I have to do. So I'm not going to worry about what somebody else is doing. You know, it's, yeah, it's, uh, and I would still do the same thing. If, you know, somebody, you know, like I've had guys come by the shop and I'll give them some epoxy. They want to make something. And so I use a proprietary epoxy. They, they blend it just for me. Randy Wirtz is a knife maker that is a head of technology at uh, System 3. And that's where I get my epoxy. Ah. So he formulates the stuff up. And, um, you know, and we're probably on our but maybe third or fourth variation, something like that. And we're just trying to get it better and better and better. And it's it's. I couldn't do what I do with off the shelf epoxy. So. I, I think like, uh, well, I think what you're saying it about collaboration, anyone who works in, in any sort of collaborative uh, process knows that to be open and to be accepting of people's ideas and, and forthcoming with your own ideas is what leads to the best end product. And, you know, like this, this individual uh, in, another country who's doing exactly your thing. I mean, you know, you can teach, you, you were mentioned Starry Night. You can teach someone how to paint. You can even teach someone exactly how you paint, right. but they don't have your instincts and they don't have your vision. And right. so, you know, they'll end up doing their own thing. And that's cool that they learn the process from you, but you're two different people with two different things eventually. But yeah, I, I think, I think it's that openness and you see it a lot here in the knife world. So many people that I've spoken to have learned their craft by just asking around and, and people reach out and reaching out and saying, Oh yeah, I'll show you how to do this. And I yeah. think people, people have that inherent knowledge that um, no matter how I teach, you know, I could teach this person every trick of making a knife. They're still not going to make my knife. They're going to make right. their knife. Yeah. And you know, there's, there's one thing that nobody can take from you and that's your brain. That's right. Yeah. You know? It's, you know, how, what are you inspired by? You know, that's, uh, you know, I get inspired by things that, you know, I, I mean, I have to write them down because sometimes they're just off the wall. I'm like, I don't know where that came from. It came from somewhere, but it's, you know, and, and then you, you go with it. So, 
And I, and I just truly, I just want to have fun with this. You know, I, I have fun when I write up my description. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> just make up a big BS story about <laughs> what, what it is or where it came from or, you know, Idaho mudwood, you know, there's no Idaho mudwood. I just made it up. And, <laughs> you, know, you know, Uncle Bob found it on the East Slope when he was camping or something, you know, and it's like, I have fun doing that. It's like the old um, Jay Peterman catalog <laughs> that used to be yeah. on uh, Seinfeld. Anyway, Seinfeld. yeah, yeah. Well, um, I, I, for one, am really excited about Cow Carta. I mean, we started this conversation uh, and I was gushing about G Carta, which I still love. But now I cannot wait to see Cow Carta and see it proliferate uh, in the knife world. I can't wait to see what what my favorite knife makers do with it once, uh, you know, once you feel like it's ready for broad exposure or, or however that works. And uh, I, 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 uh, I admire your creative mind with this stuff, Greg. Oh, thanks. It just, yeah. It's just fun. You know, you, you honestly, when you stop doing things for money and start doing it because you enjoy it, it's the best, you know, and it just, that's where I'm at. So, well, for our sake, please yeah, keep having fun and keep making <laughs> this cool stuff and keep uh, innovating and uh, we'll keep we'll keep buying it and we'll keep supporting you. Thank well, you, I Greg, for coming on. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast, sir. It's been a pleasure meeting you and talking Thank about you. your awesome stuff. Oh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been fun. And uh, this this is a great change of pace for me. So, it, and it caused me, you know, I'll come away and I'll think about it and I'll, I'll get another idea. So. Cool. One, one more time before we sign off, let, let me see your pro tech and I'll show you my pro tech. Okay. It sounds corny as hell, but Hey man, why not? There's, God, yeah. I love... And I, um, I went, I went to the show in, let's see here in Fort Worth. Nice. Do we have time for one more quick story? Please. Okay. So when I first started out, my, my friend and I, we used to go out, uh, for breakfast all the time in California. And, um, uh, and I'd ask him dumb questions, you know, because I didn't know what was going on. And and so he says, well, when Enrique Pena calls you up, then you can do that. You know, and that was kind of a standard answer, basically telling me to just, you know, put on the mute button, dude. You're not there. You got a lot to learn. Right. So at any rate, one day we're at breakfast and the phone rings, you know, and I answer it. And it's Enrique Pena. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> and uh I felt like, hey, I've arrived, you know? And yeah, so, and yeah. Enrique and I have become friends. And, you know, not only is he a great knife maker, he's a great guy. And uh, so, anyway, when I was at, in uh, uh, Fort Worth, he he hands me this knife. And uh, let's see. Beautiful. There you go. And so there's the rag. And that's a color rag that Mikey came up with called um, Peacock. And so I don't know if you, you can't really see the color. It's, it's it really beautiful. does have pretty colors in it. There's some more. It's all sorts of teals and turquoise and dark blues and green. Yeah. No, and Mikey's, not. you know, favorite bird is peacock. So anyway, Enrique hands me this knife and um, I says, that's sold? And he goes, no, you want it? And I'm like, yeah. So anyway, I have my knife and uh I always, when I first started, I always wanted an Enrique Penny knife because it was just so clean and classic and yes just, you know guy's a master well so, i hope i hope you told your friend hey in your face buddy it's yeah. enrique <laughs> yeah but, yeah he knows and it, it's uh, it's all in good fun you know it's yeah. uh, all in good fun but it just you know these guys were like my heroes and now we've become friends and that's uh that's pretty special in itself um, right on. so well thanks greg it's been a pleasure i'm gonna likewise bob Thank you. Um, it's uh, It's been great, and uh, I hope to speak with you soon, sir. Sounds good. Take care. All right. You too. Bye. Visit The Knife Junkie at thenifejunkie.com to catch all of our podcast episodes, videos, photos, and more. Yeah, there he goes, Greg yeah. Hansen Sr. That was, uh, man, it was really cool to talk about this material that, that I have fallen fast and hard for. Uh, it's beautiful stuff, and... How Carta, how awesome. 
is it that he has turned his skills towards leather, one of my very favorite substances in the world. So we all look forward to, to checking out how cow uh, carta makes its way uh, onto our favorite knives. And uh, I, I think I speak for all of us when I say that. In any case, uh, join us here again next week, next Sunday, for another great interview with another, uh, another outstanding knife personality. And until then, I'm Bob DeMarco saying uh, for Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.